Merry Christmas. It's a good thing we're Methodists because we have warm hearts. Well, we do, and we're here tonight warm in spirit, no matter what the temperature might be outside. So indeed, it is a blessed Christmas Eve, and we greet you in Christ. My name is Drew Harvey, and I'm your, one of your liturgists tonight. We welcome you to Trinity United Methodist Church, and we pray that God will bless us in our time of worship. There's a couple announcements that I would make. First, to remind you all that there will be one service of worship tomorrow, Christmas Day, at 10 a.m., and then again on next Sunday, New Year's Day, again at 10 a.m. And we hope that you will come and share together as we praise God for his blessings. Our opening hymn tonight is Adeste Fidelis, O Come All Ye Faithful, verses 1 through 4, number 234 in the hymn book. And the uh, words will be flashed on the screen. If able, let us stand and greet the born of the birth of Christ.
Please be seated. At this time, would the children come forward for our children's message? everyone. How are we doing tonight? Good. I'm so glad to see all of you up here tonight on this Christmas Eve, and I want to show you one of my favorite tricks. I think I've shown you this before, so if I have, don't give it away. Just watch and let everybody else enjoy it as well. This is my ring trick. It's called the jumping ring. I use this as a backdrop so that it makes it very clear what happens, but I'm going to show you this ring, and it's over here, okay? And I will make it jump over to here, all right? Watch carefully, you'll see it jump from here to here on the count of three. Are you ready? Here we go, watch. One, two, oh, there are two, three. Did you see it jump that time? It actually did it on the count of two, didn't it? When I count to three, it'll jump the second time. Will you see it one more time? Ready, watch. One, two, three. Did you see it jump? Isn't that neat? You know how it works? I know how it works too. Yeah, I taught you that one, didn't I? And you know what, I'll teach all of you. And I'll teach all of you how that one works too. I don't usually give away my magic tricks, but tonight I wanna show you how this one works because I want you to understand a very important principle in magic and in life. And it's all about where we focus our attention. Right now I want you to focus your attention up here. That's why I use this black backdrop from this music stand. It focuses your attention right here. And then I tell you to focus your attention right there. And so everybody, and I'm looking here, you're looking here, they're looking here, all the attention is right here, which is exactly where I want it, because where the sneaky move happens is up here. Yep. And you don't see that, because you're focused right here. Here's how it goes, all right? I'll do it in slow motion this time, ready? One. Two. You see how that? And then three, but now I'm, wa I'm going up here and so you're all watching with me. But when I'm directing my attention here and I do it quick, it looks like this. One, two, three. And it switches just like that. Now you could even do the disappearing ring trick. I'll show you that one, although I won't tell you how that one works. Watch, are you ready? See right here, watch. One, two, three. That time it disappeared altogether, right? <laughs> Behind my ear, how does that work? Here's the idea, here's the idea, all right? The idea is, as magicians, we want you to focus your attention where we want you to focus your attention. And we don't want you to look up behind the ear or other places, and so we focus your attention here. And tonight, I want you to help, I wanna help you focus your attention where it needs to be. At Christmas time, it's so easy to focus our attention on Santa Claus and on presents and on candy and all that stuff, and I love all that stuff, it's great. But tonight, I want you to focus your attention not on candy, not on presents, but on Jesus. Because Jesus is the reason that we celebrate Christmas. And Jesus came into this world as a little tiny baby to show how much God loves us. And God loves each and every one of you. And I hope that if you forget everything else we've done tonight, you can forget how to do this trick because I'm not supposed to give away secrets anyway. But I hope you remember that Jesus loves you and that God sent Jesus to show you how much he loves you. All right, let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you that you love us so much, and we thank you that tonight you can help us to focus our attention, at least for a little while, on you and on the reason why we celebrate Christmas, the love that you have in Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, boys and girls, and I think there's a special treat over here. Looks like candy canes, one for each of you. Yeah, you knew the candy canes would be a big thing tonight, didn't you? I thought it was I know ring pops. <laughs> you were hoping it was ring pops, yeah, there you go. There's one for you, look. 
Yeah, you do, don't you? All right. You're welcome. There you go. Thank you, and Merry Christmas to you too. Thank you, Reese. All right. For the lighting of our Advent candles, we do it a little bit differently on this Christmas Eve night. Instead of lighting it immediately after the children's message as we have on Sunday mornings, we will light each candle progressively as we read a scripture and sing. And so the first scripture reading is from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. I will read it, and then as we sing the uh, first verse of Hark the Herald Angels Sing together, I'll light the first candle, and then we'll continue through all four candle, the first four candles in that fashion. The word of the prophet, Isaiah 9, verses 2 through 7. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as people rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Please remain seated and sing together. Number 240, verse 1, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. The word of the prophet Isaiah from the seventh chapter. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of men? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Hear the word of the Lord. The carol, What Child Is This? The words are printed in the bulletin on the screen or in your hymn book. What 
the candle of joy. We read again from Isaiah chapter 11, verses one through six. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes, or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will lie with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the goat the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. Please remain sitting as we sing Angels from the Realms of Glory. The candle of love. The words again of the prophet Isaiah, or rather of Micah, excuse me, reading from the fifth chapter, verses one through four. Marshal your troops, O city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. But you, O Bethlehem Ephratah, Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor gives birth, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. The word of the Lord. And the carol, O little town of Bethlehem, remain seated as we sing prayerfully.
everlasting light the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight i invite you now to join in the christmas prayer which you find printed in your bulletins and it is upon the screens i believe let us pray in unison the Christmas prayer. Loving God, be present with us as we remember the birth of Jesus, your Son and our Savior. Help us to share in the songs of angels and the glad worship of shepherds. As we gather around the holy newborn child, close the door of our hate and open the door of our love over all your world. Let your mercy accompany every gift and kindness come with every greeting. Deliver us from evil, forgive us our sins, and teach us to be joyously devoted to Christ and his life-giving kingdom. May our worship at this Christmas Bring honor to you, O Lord. May your presence with us lead us to good news, great joy, and a newborn heart as we rejoice. Praise your everlasting name. In the name of the child of Bethlehem, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let us pray in silence our prayers of worship. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may our songs of praise rise as we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior. Amen. And now would you give your attention to the Robel family as they come up for special music, What Child Is This?
Thank you very much for that great, great presentation of a beautiful carol. Hear now the Holy Gospel as it comes from St. Luke, chapter 2, verses 15 through 20. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Thanks be to thee, O God, for this thy holy gospel. Amen. For our ministry moment tonight, uh, we don't pass an offering plate anymore and take up a collection in that sense, but we do have a plate at the back of the church if you'd like to give something, you're welcome to do that tonight. We try to highlight something going on at Trinity or through Trinity that uh, we've been doing, and boy, what an exciting year it's been. It's been an exciting year of a lot of firsts at Trinity. Let me recap some of those firsts for you. We had our first membership class since pre-COVID, so in the last three years, we had not had a membership class until this spring, and we welcomed 23 new members and seven confirmands into our membership this year after a three-year hiatus. It was the first time that we as a church made the bold decision to give away our entire Easter offering to go beyond our own doors to meet the needs of people in Ukraine. It was our first baptism by immersion. Some of you were here for that. Remember, we had a big horse trough up here and had poor Jessica get into that cold water. Um, but she loved doing it, and it was a nice way to recognize a baptism here at Trinity of the United Methodist Church. It was our first time doing more than 100 shoe boxes for Operation Christmas Child. It was our first time doing 30,000 meals for Rise Against Hunger. It was our first time supporting Holidays from the Heart, that wonderful initiative that we had Marianne Cornetti come and share about back in October. And I was privileged just last week to go with Karen to Western Psych to see the presentation of those gifts. And they were able to give gifts to every resident in Western Psych as well as in several other facilities in Pittsburgh, not just to the children, but to people of all ages. It was our first time supporting that. Last month, it was the first time since before COVID that we have had over 200 people in worship, and we've had it twice in the past month. And so I'm pleased to see people coming back to worship and new people joining us in worship. There are some, these are some significant firsts, and I believe they happen when we choose to put God first in our lives. And so this Christmas Eve night, I invite you to put God first in your life, to think about how you can put God first through your giving, how you can put, through, put God first through the way that you live your life, the way that you spend your time, the way that you are who you are. When we put God first, wonderful things happen. Thank you for putting God first. Let's pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks that you have been at work in and among us as a church as well as through individuals. And we pray that you would continue to grow our faith and help us to reach more people with your love and with your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our second gospel reading tonight is from Matthew's gospel, chapter six, verses 25 to 34. And I invite you to follow along with me as we read a text that has become, I'm sure, quite familiar to most of you. 
uh, that have been coming to church over the past four weeks. We've used this as our Advent lesson and spent the last three weeks preaching on this exact same text. So we're gonna bring it to a close here tonight with a look at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and what he had to say about worry. Listen for how many times he says, do not worry in this passage. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his glory was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come before your word tonight, and we ask that you would speak to us, speak to our hearts, speak to our lives, and once more, Lord, let us hear this message about what truly matters in life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Can I have your attention, please? I like attention, you can have it back now. Thank you very much. Just kidding, do I have your attention? I'm asking for the gift of your attention. And I don't know how difficult that might be for you tonight as you're thinking about other things, thinking about Christmas, thinking about family, thinking about whatever's going on tomorrow, but I'm asking that you're able to put aside all of that for an hour and focus your attention on Jesus. Focus your attention on why we celebrate Christmas. And I'm asking for that because attention is a priceless gift. And it requires focus because you have to focus your attention. You have to pay attention. When we think about paying something, that's a sacrifice. It means that you're putting away your phone. It means that you're putting away the television, turning off the screen or the radio or whatever and focusing your attention here. And that isn't easy to do, but you're doing it tonight and I thank you for it. Because so many times we try to divide our attention. We try to focus on one thing while doing something else. How many people think that you're good at multitasking? Some people are, you know, I've heard multitasking is simply doing many things poorly all at the same time. Because we're not able to, we just as human beings, we can't function that way. We're not able to focus fully on two things or in two places both at the same time. Shortly, I'm going to show you a magic trick. It's the fastest magic trick in the world, which tonight will involve the flash appearance of a Santa hat. And it works on the principle that you can't focus your attention on two places at the exact same time. For example. All right, thank you, Mac. Now, how many of you saw me put the hat on because you were looking over at Mac over there, right? I don't know how it played on TV, but for those of you that were on TV, you probably were able to focus on me because that's where the camera was. But I'm hoping for many of you in the audience are like, what is Mac doing over there? Mac did a great job. We had set this up and I asked him to do exactly that, to create a disturbance, to distract your attention for a moment so that I could illustrate that point. Hopefully it worked for you. But the idea behind it is that we, we can't, if we hear something, our, that's where our attention goes. That's where our focus shifts. And we just, we can't do two things at once. Hard though we might try 
to do so. So what are some things that compete for your attention? What are some things that are weighing heavily on your mind, maybe even right now? If you're worried about, gosh, do I have all the presents wrapped? Do I have all the food prepared the way it's supposed to be? Is the weather gonna be okay for traveling tomorrow? Is everyone gonna be able to come? Boy, if that person didn't come, it wouldn't be so bad, would it? Right, I mean, we think about these things. We think about these things, but can we focus our attention where it needs to be? Put aside our worries and focus on Jesus. Because Jesus has a few things to say about attention, and we spent the last several weeks looking at those through this odd Christmas passage. I I don't even call it a Christmas passage because it isn't, Matthew 6, and yet we've turned it into that because it's about worry. And at this season of the year, we tend to heighten our level of worry over a variety of things. Jesus focuses on three of those things here in this passage, and so I've addressed those over the past several weeks. A focus on worry, a focus on wealth, and last week we looked at a focus on what's next and that continual drive for something more. Tonight, let's shift our focus from worry and wealth and what's next to what matters. Jesus says three times, I don't know if you caught that, I said, listen to how many times Jesus says, do not worry. He says it three times in that passage. Do not worry about your life. Do not worry about what you eat. Do not worry. You know, as a kid, I used to worry about Christmas. And I used to worry so much sometimes that I couldn't sleep the night before Christmas. Because I was so worried about falling asleep because I believed that if I, fell asleep, if I didn't fall asleep, Santa wouldn't come. And so I'm sitting there trying to sleep, but I'm worried because I'm not sleeping yet, and if I don't sleep, he's not gonna come. And so that made me worry even more, and I remember my mother just being at wit's end trying to get me to fall asleep some nights because I was so worried. And you know what, as a kid that happened to me, as an adult that happens to me sometimes as well. Not, not, that, I fall, not that I have trouble falling asleep, but that my worry about what might happen takes away my joy and my experience of what is happening. Do you know what I mean by that? Does that ever happen to you? You worry so much about what might happen that it takes away your joy and your experience of what is happening. And instead of living in the moment, as Jesus invites us to, we're worried about tomorrow, which is one of the specific things Jesus says, don't do, don't worry about tomorrow. When it comes to worry, Jesus Jesus teaches us this, the more we focus on what worries us most, the less we focus on what matters most. Because we can't focus on two things at once. So if we're focused so much on what worries us, We can't focus on what matters to us. And I know it's easy just to say, well, just don't worry. And Jesus says it three times, just don't worry. I wish it were that simple. It's not. But I do believe that if we shift our focus, if we train our minds, if we open our hearts to the lessons of Jesus, to the words of Jesus, it can help us to shift our focus away from what worries us and towards what matters to us. If we shift our focus away from the material to the spiritual, it helps us to worry less. If we shift our focus away from ourselves and toward our Savior, it helps us to worry less. Those things help. They don't solve the problem, but they certainly do help us if we focus on this idea that when we want to stop worrying, if we shift our focus away from what worries us towards what matters to us, that begins that journey towards a life of less worry. What worries us? The second thing we looked at was wealth. Boy, I don't think there's any better way to talk about wealth at Christmas time than a Christmas carol in Ebenezer Scrooge. Karen and I had the opportunity to go to Chicago a couple of weeks ago, and we saw that play at the Goodman Theater there in Chicago. What a wonderful reminder of what matters in life. I'm hoping you're familiar with the story. I don't have time to go over the whole thing with you tonight. 
But just the idea that there's this guy, Ebenezer Scrooge, who hates Christmas, and he's bah humbugging the whole season, even though everyone around him is trying to enjoy their Christmas. And he's visited by three ghosts, the ghost of Christmas past, Christmas present, and Christmas future, who show him what was, what is, and what will be if Scrooge doesn't change who he is and how he sees things today. And as a result of those visits from those ghosts, Scrooge changes everything because he does not want to live into the future that he saw set up for himself if he continued on the path that he was on. So as we think about wealth, And as we think about what matters most to us, for Scrooge, it was all about the money. It was all about making money, more of it, and not spending it on anyone else or anything else, not giving it away, not sharing it, but hoarding it. And by the end of the story, Scrooge realizes, I have a lot of resources that I could use to help others and to bless them and to make their lives better. And in making their lives better, it's gonna make my life better. And so Scrooge changes the way he does things And we learn that lesson in Scrooge, and we learn that powerful lesson in that story, which is this principle. The idea that when we focus less on what things are worth to us, and more on what we are worth to Jesus, once again, we begin to worry a little bit less, because we've shifted our attention away and in the right direction. You know, the Apostle Peter saw that happen as well. We looked in recent weeks at the story of a rich man who came to Jesus and asked, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus says, well, follow the commandments, do what is right. And the man says, I've done all those things already. And then Jesus looks at him and says, one thing you lack, go and sell everything you have and give to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven. And then the man went away very sad because he had great wealth and he wasn't willing to give that up. And after hearing that story, Peter turned to Jesus and said, Lord, we've given everything up to follow you. What will there be for us? And then Jesus promises Peter an exponential reward in heaven one day for the sacrifices that Peter was making in his life here and now. And what Jesus was teaching Peter is not to measure his worth in dollars, but to measure his worth in discipleship. And Jesus would say the same thing to us here tonight. Are you measuring your worth in dollars? Or are you measuring your worth in discipleship? In the way that you serve in the name of Jesus in the way that you give in the name of Jesus, in the way that you help others in the name of Jesus, in the way that you love in the name of Jesus. How are you measuring what you're worth? Worry, wealth. Last week we then looked at that third area of focus on what's next. And we find that if we get too bogged down worrying about what's next, we can miss out on what matters. You know, that's been a whirlwind for me for the last several years. We moved here about six and a half years ago. And when we moved here, we had three kids in high school, and we were moving them into a new school. I was starting a new church. Karen was starting a new job. That was quite the whirlwind. And now this year we're facing empty nests as Jeremy's off at college, and all all the boys are gone, and Gabby's got three kids now with a fourth one on the way. Johnny's going to graduate in May and then get married in July. And we can sit there and think about, what's that going to do to our family dynamic? How is life going to change for us once all these changes start to occur? And if I'm too focused on what's next, again, I can miss out on what's happening now. And so it's a real challenge for me, and I'm guessing for you as well, to stop focusing on what's next and what's the future going to hold and what's it gonna look like then and how are we gonna get through this? And instead, just to enjoy the moment that we're living in today. Jesus brings all of this home at the end by saying, don't run after all of this crazy stuff. The pagans run after all these things. Don't worry about that stuff. Seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness and all this other stuff will work itself out. When we choose to seek first God's kingdom, and God's righteousness, 
then we find that life somehow seems to fall into place a lot better. And I've discovered that, and I hope that you do as well. Because all of that worry and all of that stuff that goes on, it can take away from what truly matters. Final example that I want to give you. when we, I had Drew read from Luke's Gospel, chapter 2. And in verse 19, all this stuff is going on. Mary's just had a baby. And now she's got these shepherds coming in, talking about seeing a vision of angels. And, you know, I can imagine how much is going on around her in that moment. And what Mary does, it says that Mary kept or treasured all these things up, pondering them in her heart. She was able somehow to push aside all the things that was going on and instead focus on what she treasured about that moment. What do you treasure about this moment? What do you treasure about Christmas 2022? How do you put Jesus first? How do you figure out what truly matters in your life? I believe that we find that when we begin to focus on what's really important to us. If you have time sometime, Google the five biggest regrets of the dying. It's an interesting study that someone did to find out as people are approaching the end of their lives, what matters to them most, what are the regrets that they had. It could help reshape the way that we live our lives now if we think about what truly matters the most to us. I say this not to be morbid. We're all going to meet our end someday. What's going to matter to us then? Hopefully what matters is what Jesus spent his whole life talking about. Love. The love of God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. That's the number one commandment. Number two commandment, love others as you love yourself. If he could take all the law, all the Bible, everything that was studied and worried about and and scanned over and preached about and everything else, Jesus says he would sum it up in those two simple things. So are you focusing on love this Christmas season? Are you focusing on the love that you have for God, on the love that God has for you, and on the love that you have for your neighbor, for others that are around you? This Christmas season, open up your hearts to receive the love of Jesus. What matters? God's love shown to us in the form of Jesus coming down to earth, showing us what a life of love and a life of sacrifice and a life of devotion to God looks like and inviting us to join him in that journey. Are you willing to love as Jesus loved? Are you willing to live as Jesus lived? And ultimately, are you willing to stop worrying about what's next and start focusing on what matters? Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you that you turn our attention away from what worries us and about what's next and about wealth to what matters in life. Lord, at the end of our lives, there's really only one thing that's going to matter. And it's that love. It's the love that we have for you, the love that you have for us, the love that we were able to share, and the love that is so strong that it will carry us into the arms of eternity with you one day. Lord, help us to embrace that love now while we still can. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Now we'll have some time of singing some uh, popular Christmas carols. You can again remain seated as we sing the first verse of each of these songs printed in your bulletin as well as on the words Uh, the words that are on the screen, beginning with a way in a manger.
There is an absolutely beautiful thing about light, about fire, that is also true of love. And that is that it has the ability to multiply without diminishing its source. In a moment, I'll light from the love candle, I'll light the Christ candle. And then I'll take the light of that Christ candle and give it to the ushers who asked to come forward here. And those ushers will then come and uh, distribute it to each and every one of you. And as that light passes from one person to the next, it is amazing and you'll see it happen here that your light doesn't diminish at all by sharing it with someone else. The same is true of your love. It doesn't diminish at all by sharing it with someone else. And so as we share the light of Christ, may we also be called to share the love of Christ with the world, recognizing that it's not going to diminish us. It's going to help multiply God's love and God's light to the world. As we sing this song, Silent Night, I invite you to uh, pass your light on to the next person. Will the ushers come forward at this time? Oh, and instructions. The one that has the, the flame on it, keep your candle upright. The person who does not have a flame, extend your candle so that you don't drip wax. Person with the flame, keep your candle upright. Thank you. Please stand.
though we extinguish the candle, do not let the light of Christ be extinguished from your hearts or the love of Christ from your lives. Please remain standing as we close with number 246, Joy to the World. And I know we're a small crowd tonight, but let me hear you sing. Remember, if you're able to come and join us tomorrow for worship, I think what better way to celebrate the actual day of our Savior's birth than by coming to church and sharing that with us tomorrow at 10. Um, if not, celebrate at home, and we hope to see you again in the new year. May you all have a wonderful Merry Christmas. Go in the peace and love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.